So without further ado, please welcome Mona Sabani to the show. Welcome, Mona. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Oh, you're so welcome. I have been, like I told you before we hit record, been listening to Audible, your book, uh, Proof of Spiritual Phenomenon and learning about you through other podcasts that you've been on to promote now that you've just, the book just recently came out in August Mm -hmm. and you know, that's, it's about, you know, getting, getting the word out and listening, but listening to your story. And I explained in the intro that our mutual friend, Royce Christian um, had his, on his Instagram story, had the Chelsea Handler podcast. Did you see that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. And I thought, oh, well, if he loves this girl, I'm going to love her. So that's really what, it, cause you just know that when you resonate with someone like I do with yes, him, yes. I just, it was not even a question. I'm like, right. Wrote your name down. I have to start searching. What does he love about this woman? <laughs> uh, what's their connection? But, um, so that's where it started. And so I, I, I call this podcast and cover your magic and you have so much magic because the way, and what I love about you too, is that, you know, the science background and then all, you know, in house, I mean, you're beyond the, I mean, so smart <laughs> by the time the book is where I'm at now in like chapter 10, I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to really sit down. I can't be walking and listening. Cause it's so you're just, it's these studies that you do are so amazing, but what I would love to share, I can't go without sharing the, when you say, um, the old you would not like the new you mm-hmm. or would hate the new you. And I want people to get like, you know, it's okay to venture out and learn something new and question things like you do and try to wonder why, why do I always, why have I thought this way? And all these other things are popping up to make me, make me question that. And that's right. what you did and you still do it. So you're on this journey. You, you, you're born on this planet to this family. You're, um, what, what, what nationality? Persian. 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 You're Persian. You grew up with a Persian family mom, but let's go, um, to those, to the coffee readings. I mean, you tell me where you want to start. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, my story starts with, um, with these, so I'm Persian, that's my cultural heritage. And then in, in our culture, as in many cultures around the world, um, we have a, a tradition of divination using, in our case, in my my family's case, it's using coffee grounds. So it's like thicker kind of coffee. <clears throat> and you drink it, you leave the grounds in the cup, flip it over, let it dry and pictures emerge. And then if you are lucky enough to have a reader they can look at the images and kind of tell you you know intuit things about your past present or future and my grandmother could do it um and my she taught my my mother how to do it and this was always going on in the background of our home but I never really I never paid attention I was also young I nobody offered me coffee um and it wasn't until (laughs) graduate school that I would come home on the weekends and my mom would make me coffee and she would just absentmindedly pick up the cup and start um, describing what she would see. And, uh, you know, I didn't really, uh, I don't know if I, be- I didn't believe it, <laughs> but it was a <laughs> bonding moment with my mom and I just let her do it. And then over time though, I started realizing that, um, yeah, the things that she would say would come true and they would, they would be really specific things. The, the thing that started to really get pique my interest and, um, caused me to start writing down in detail the readings over the years was that she would see these really small details about situations that were very meaningful and significant to the situation, but that she never would have been able to guess. Um, You know, usually she didn't even know what was going on. You know, like, let's say if it was something at work, like I don't come home and tell my mom everything, every drama at work, but she would describe it perfectly, you know, and be like, there's this person that looks like this or whatever. And she would say some small detail that would be relevant and significant and meaningful, and it would blow me away. And so Mm -hmm. I started taking notes and I could never explain it with my science because there's no framework for that in our current scientific paradigm. So I never bothered to to explain it um, or try to explain it. I just kept it separate in my mind. Um, I mean, I think at the beginning of grad school, I was more interested in kind of thinking about 
oh, the universe. And like, what does this mean? But once again, to think of it, you're too tired <laughs> to think about right. anything other than what you're working on. Cause you just want to graduate and get out of there. So, um, so yeah, I just stopped, um, trying to figure it out. And then it wasn't until years later, uh, maybe like three or four years after I graduated when she would continue to, to read my coffee and I, it, it, but there were two big emotional events that happened for me where that caused me to take, like, look at this phenomenon more carefully. And one was, um, I had my, my mom kept seeing a bad news in my cup and, um, which she usually not, you know, wouldn't say, or usually didn't even see bad news, but this one was like really bad. And so she huh. kept telling me about it for weeks and weeks, kind of like, okay, I don't want to panic you. And I'm not going to tell you what it is, but, um, just expect to get some bad news. And, and she wouldn't tell me much else. So I kind of lived in this terror for five weeks. And then, um, and then I found out that one of our professors at USC, um, was killed by one of the students in the program. So it was very, it was just a very unusual thing that happened. It's not very common, obviously, and the circumstances were unusual. And so after I found out, I called my mom back um, and I was like, oh, I think I know, I think I know what it was. And I told her and she was, and she said, yes, it was a it was a death that I saw, but I didn't want to say, cause you know, it's like upsetting why upset you five weeks in advance. Right. Um, or maybe you just worry. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, and, and she said it was very unusual and she'd never seen anything like it before. And, and that was another reason she didn't want to say anything because the readings are symbolic. So sometimes you don't know what the symbols mean <laughs> until right. the event happens. So, so she was, um, I mean, she knew it was a death for sure. And she knew it was unusual, but that's all. And so anyway, so that really shook me because I, I just, um, it was like fine when she was, you know, predicting things that were small <laughs> about right. my life or like my work life or whatever. But then this was a really big, this was a life or death thing. So it, it really upset me, you know, and I was, I was very, um, curious about how, uh, that information could be out there somewhere in advance of the event happening. And because it was also, it seemed like a spontaneous, um, kind of spontaneous thing. And right. so, so I, it just, uh, confounded me and made me really curious, but I was, I didn't, um, start researching or, or reading or anything, um, just cause I was so busy at the time. But then two years later, my mom saw this relationship coming and she saw it was going to be like a positive outcome and all that. And then we broke up. So then I didn't think it was positive. So, um, but she had all the, you know, details, right. Um, but by this point I was, I was out of grad school. I was feeling kind of purposeless. Like it's hard to go from working towards like a very clear goal, like your PhD to hitting the, um, workforce. And I mean, maybe it was just the jobs that I had. I'm starting to realize, cause now I'm doing what I enjoy. <laughs> right. Totally. Yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, I felt very purposeless and I, I was very much like, well, so what does the mean? Even though, even though I, at the time thought our work was important, like we were still doing research and it was, but and it was about health and behavior, but for some reason, like something just wasn't clicking. And I just kept thinking like, what is the point of all this? So when that relationship ended, um, that was like the last, like, I think of it as like, um, a stool with legs. And that was like the last leg of the stool was knocked out. And so right. I was just like, it was my dark night of the soul. I was very, just unhappy and sad. And, um, are you, are you holding on to, are you holding on to the relationship because your mom, you felt like there was, that was because she told you it was coming. Are you like forgetting oh, all the red flags? Yes. I think that happened a little bit. Um, but I mean, it was, it was, he was great. I don't want to talk about it too much, but I mean, he was great, but yes, there were a lot of, and I don't think it's, again, it's not the coffee's fault. It's all me, right? Like if I had right. just <laughs> been more, um, willing <laughs> to see, but it wasn't any of that because it was that I had already decided that the next person I date was going to save me. Like that had already happened in my mind. So it didn't even matter the rest of it. Um, but yeah, maybe it contributed to it, but it, it definitely, and you know, in the end, it did turn out positively for me. It just didn't it's feel positive. for you. Right. Right. Yeah. It just didn't feel positive in the moment. Right. <laughs> so, 
and that's that was a you know but th these were the kinds of things that I got interested in and and um and kind of wanted to explore like what is the nature of these readings and the way that you interpret them and do things change or is there fate or destiny or or what you know I was just kind of curious and so um I was in a pretty dark place <laughs> isolating for a while but then my I have a group of girlfriends from childhood and one of them had gone through something similar and she went to um she went and got a bunch of psychic readings to make herself feel better and she suggested that she's like well you got to go see this girl I know she's really good um and I was like oh I'm not going to a psychic that's ridiculous but then you know my friends were multiple of them a few of them had gone to this lady and so they're like no let's go it'll be fun we can take notes and we can compare and see you know like whatever we'll see so we did this kind of pseudo ex not experiment but just this thing for ourselves where we went to we went to one psychic um like back to back um and then we went to a bunch of different psychics at once and then we returned over time and then we would swap readings just to see if um right. you know they would make sense for for each of us like if the things that they said were vague in general like oh you're one door is closing and another is opening or something like that like then it wouldn't um that would we, we wouldn't think it was real but but they were all very specific to each of us. <laughs> wow. And so we're like, huh, interesting. And I thought it was interesting, but again, I, I didn't dive into it or anything. And then it was the, um, I was listening to Chelsea Handler's 2019 book, uh, Life Will Be the Death of Me. And she made a podcast, um, a like limited series podcast. And I was listening to it and it was not about any of the stuff. It was about personality and therapy and the Enneagram and things like that. And then, um, and then randomly one of her episodes, she had Laura Lynn Jackson on who's a psychic medium and Laura Lynn Jackson starts talking about um, this spiritual framework where earth is a school, you come to learn lessons, um, you have soul groups and all that. And then I remembered that the intuitives that I had gone and seen and got readings from, they had mentioned those things too. But since I didn't believe in those things, I just ignored it and right. wrote it down, but I never, it never registered in my mind what they were saying. Yeah. And so when I heard Laura Lynn Jackson describing it, I was like, whoa, this sounds familiar. Oh, this is what the intuitive said. And so I wrote down what she was saying because I'd never heard of it before. And then I went back to the intuitive readings to see if they made more sense now and that they did. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I see what I was missing. And I was like, oh, this totally okay. went over my head when she was telling me <laughs> right. this reading. Um, and then Laura Lynn Jackson also said that there were like two other things this this podcast was very transformational for me. Yes, <laughs> serendipitous. I know, I love it. Yeah. Um, she talks about her and Chelsea also mentioned Many Lives, Many Masters, the book by Brian Weiss. But and so I ordered that. And then she, Laura Lynn also said she um let works with scientists to let them measure her brain waves. So she mentions this research center. So I wrote all that down, ordered the book. It came. I didn't even know what it was about. Um, and I read it, and then the the book was kind of shook my worldview a little bit. And, and that's when it really started. Um, so it was very, very casual up until I read the book. And then when I read Many Lives, Many Masters, he describes the spiritual framework again, but he's like this well-credentialed, um, you know, well-heeled psychiatrist from Yale and Columbia, chief of psychiatry, atheist, doesn't believe in anything paranormal, and stumbles across past life regression in one of his patients. And then she also channels uh, these master spirits um, during her sessions that she doesn't remember, but they're the ones who convey to him this spiritual framework. And so I remember when I read the book, I was just like, what am I reading? This is insane. But, but it was like the third time I was hearing it. And now it was from a psychiatrist. And so I just thought, this is really weird. <laughs> and so I got curious and, and just read a bunch of all of his books. And I found other past life regression books and read them, the entire literature. Um, and then that led me into, into other avenues like um the research on reincarnation and near death experiences and there's a lot of books that combine all this evidence together so i just hit those um and then when i got tired of reading because i had so many questions even as i was reading you know i was like oh but what about this where i was like i wish i could just talk to someone um so then i thought i would go back and interview the intuitives that i that i had gotten to know <laughs> over the right. previous year um because I was interested in their experience, their personal experience too. Uh, and then I, and then I started having an identity crisis, you know, as a scientist. And so then I started interviewing my scientist colleagues 
um, to be like, do you believe in anything spiritual? What do you think about paranormal phenomena? Do you think we have it all figured out? You know? And so I just started this interview project where I would reach out to people I knew. It started with people I know. And then as I would read, I would start reaching out to um, the people's books, the, the people who wrote the books that I was reading. And, um, and then eventually I, I stumbled onto this, like, not, they're not a group, but it was a group of people who knew each other, who were like affiliated with the government or the military or various um, consulting groups who are interested in consciousness as like the connecting thing between all these things. And then that's, that's when everything took a really big turning point for me. Cause I'm like, Oh, consciousness. That's I'm a neuroscientist. <laughs> Right. You can oh relate. my gosh. Yeah. You know, now, now I don't you're have speaking. To, yeah. Like now I don't have to focus on just the paranormal and spirits and now you're talking my language. And so right. then, then I really dug in. Did you um, ever get a past life regression during that time? I yourself? did. I did. Yeah. I found a, a therapist. I've had a few, I, I thought it was, um, it was interesting. I didn't think it was going to work for me. Um, but I've been meditating for years. So I'm very good at getting into a meditative state and watching images that come into my mind. And so I did get into meditative state and it was just surprised me because she would ask questions and images would just come. And I, and I didn't expect them to, but she would ask something and I would just tell her what I was seeing. And it was this um, Irish farm life from like the 1800s or something. Um, and it was very, very vivid. So I tell this whole story. And at the end, in once the soul leaves the body, you go into this like um, afterlife situation where you meet with the souls of the other people in your life. And my therapist is like, Hey, what are you saying to them? And what are they saying to you? And up to that point, I thought I had just created like Made a it up. Right. fantasy story. But then I started answering her, like telling her what I was saying to them and what they were saying to me. And then I started like weeping. Like I couldn't even get the words out of my mouth because I was crying so hard. Oh, and, wow. And like the emotion was coming from like my stomach or like it came from my body, not my mind. Like I, I didn't think of something, get sad and start crying. Like my body was doing right. a little, it was emotional catharsis of some sort. And then my brain was like, what's happening? <laughs> right. And so, um, yeah. And then after the session, um, yep. My therapist said, um, the, the reason we think it's real is because of, um, the amount of emotion that gets mm -hmm. released, because if I asked you to make up a story and tell it to me, um, you, you normally don't have that kind of deep um, emotional catharsis. So I don't know, you know, I, I mean, I've read a lot about it. I feel like a lot of it is true. Part of it is metaphor, um, I, but I also think as a healing modality, it doesn't matter. I think it's very healing. So right. I think it's, I think it's a great modality. Yeah. I've done, yeah. I've done it too, a few times where the same thing, where I feel like I'm making it up Yeah, and I don't know where it's coming from, but I keep talking and then <laughs> I get to this place of going, I, I see it. I know. And then I'm, I'm understanding time. It's like all of this, like, um, the, the energy of a person. I connect with mm -hmm. that. And I, you know, it's like really, and yeah, healing. Do I believe, you know, like I don't look at it as I'm making it up anymore as right. for sure, mm -hmm. but it is something that I now see as a reflection of my life now. Mm -hmm. Like I see, oh, this is why I'm always interested in helping children or I've always been a teacher. Oh my gosh. I was been a teacher. Like in the last five lives I went through where okay. I was this teacher. So mm -hmm. did you see anything that was, that reminded you of what you, your passions are now from the past life that you've had? Some things. Yeah. Not the Irish one, but the other ones I've had. Um, yeah. Like I'm very social and well, I used to be <laughs> before COVID, um, but <laughs> I, I used to be very social and I would have a host a lot and I would, you know, connect a lot of different groups. Um, and and then I, in one of my lives, it seemed like I was like, it played that role, um, played a similar role in a very, very old lifetime. And then I think, what was the other? Oh yeah. And then in one, I was very witchy and huh. uh, I, mean, I don't consider myself, well, I don't know. I guess it depends on your definition of witchy, <laughs> but um, yeah, just, well, I, just in touch with nature is really more what I saw it as. 
Um, but yeah, and I, I love nature. So <laughs> it was right. very, um, that, so that kind of, that resonated. Yeah. There's lots of little things that you see in the life, the lives that you're like, oh, that's, that's why, you know, for example, in that Irish life, I just kept commenting apparently that I was cold. And then when I came out, my therapist asked, she's like, oh, do you, um, have a thing about being cold or something? And I was like, oh my God, I'm, I get cold very easily. And, um, like people are always making fun of me. And if we, if I were go anywhere, you know, with, um, w- with whoever I'm with, they'll be like, please make sure you bring a cardigan. So funny. <laughs> You're going to get cold. So funny. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk, share the story about when you asked, for, cause I'm all about signs and I always, I t- 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 tell my girls, let's find a sign today. What's our sign. You know, what is, mm-hmm. you know, what, what is it going to show us? What are we looking? It's always, so we keep, we're present in the moment. We're yes. looking instead of looking down, we're like looking at nature, we're looking at butterflies or hummingbirds or rainbows or whatever it is, right? It could be anything. I mean, you should hear some of the things I pick, but um, you, you have this moment where you're like, I'm going to like prove, let's see if this works. Like you're right. trying, like yeah. as a scientist, you know, like yes. in a scientist's mind, right. you're yeah. going to try to work and to see if this, all this stuff that they're, you're learning is really true. I mean, that's really your quest you're on now. Like, I feel like you're, it's an ongoing um, journey. Yes. And yeah, I tell one of the, I tell the, the first, the first most significant one in the book and I'll, I'll tell it right now, but um, that was one of the ways that convinced me was continuing to ask for signs. Um, And I know that's in the literature generally, but for me that I think that definitely was influenced from that podcast I heard with Laurel and Jackson, like she always talks, well, one of her books is called signs. <laughs> so, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. But, um, so for this one, it was just the beginning, the very beginning I had just, I think I had only read many lives, many masters at that point. And I was like, okay, I'll ask for signs during my meditations in the morning. Um, but then I would forget the signs that I chose <laughs> and, right. um, And I I just couldn't think of like clever ones or I don't know, whatever. And I, so I tried for a while and I was like, oh, this is so silly. I need to think of better signs. But then one day I thought, well, what if I just, okay. I was like, I, and this, I was starting to go back and forth between believing it, not believing it. Um, I mean, I hadn't started the whole research journey yet. So it was kind of the, should I even bother spending any time on this or not question? That's what was going on. And then so I asked the universe, I said, well, I'm just gonna, if you want me to believe in this stuff mm-hmm. or, you know, continue reading, then I need a really big sign. And I, I need one that like you choose that is proves to me the meaningfulness of this topic in my life. And it has to be so big that I cannot miss it. So it can't be like a butterfly, you know, on my patio, because um, I'm going to miss that for sure. So right. I set that, you know, intention um, and then it, it, in the middle of the week, like Wednesday or something, and then Friday or Saturday night, I was driving with my friends to um, a restaurant for a friend's birthday and half of our friends were already there. So they, um, called me on the way when we were, we were like very close. We we're almost there. And they called me and they're like, how far are you away from the restaurant? And I was like, I'm only like five minutes away. What's going on? And they're like, you're never going to believe who's here. Chelsea Handler. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> Just had goose oh, but like I, yeah I had so I mean actually I was so in my head like I wasn't even at the dinner <laughs> right. from the moment they called me to the moment I got there and I saw her there and like the whole time I was in my head like oh my god this is so weird I can't believe this I had like goosebumps I I couldn't believe it you know I just I was in shock and awe really of, of it and um we didn't you know, we don't want to bother her. We, but we ended up all leaving the restaurant at the same time. And so we told her um, that we loved her book because we had all read it and we just kind of fangirled out, but <laughs> you didn't say you were, you were my sign. <laughs> so I, tell her. No, I didn't tell her, uh, but I, uh, apparently I just found this old, th- I went home and sent her a message um, saying, saying that we had um, seen her and that we, we don't want to bother her. And um um, I think I mentioned, oh, I just, because of you read many lives, many masters and it's already, and I think I wrote like, I'm a skeptic. I'm a neuroscientist. Right. <laughs> um, I just read the book, but it's, it's already opened my thinking a little bit. So it was actually interesting to find that old message because 
well, first of all, I don't remember sending it, um, but it was funny to see how I described it to her at the right. time. So, and where you're yeah, at now. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It was very meaningful night. Oh, the whole thing. oh geez. Are you kidding? <laughs> but she even had the moment where she was talking because she's skeptical. And I know that's probably why you were attracted to even listening to her podcast or, right, you yes. know, you know, that was, you had that connection with her, mm-hmm. but when she has the moment of getting into the airplane and the book that she has in front of her seat yeah. is many lives, many masters. Like what yeah. the heck is that? Yeah, I know. I love that story. I think it's such a good story. And that's sort of what partly what um, propels me to get the book. It's right. She's, she's having dinner with a friend in New York, I think. Um, and they get an argument at dinner because a friend is telling her to read the book and it's so interesting and tell describing the concepts behind it and she gets in a fight saying that's ridiculous that's stupid it doesn't exist I'm never going to read that leaves the dinner gets on a plane to fly to LA and the book Many Lives and Masters is sitting in her like yeah in the um, pocket in the seat in front of her on the plane so then she reads it because it's a short book and a <laughs> long flight and then by the time she lands, I think she says, she was like, everyone has to read this book. <laughs> I thought it was that's such a good funny. story. Oh, that's such a great story. What was your connection with Royce? Cause you do talk about him in your book and you talk about how that even was a magical moment and where it opened your eyes to. Yeah, it was like you um, kind of questioned it and you kind of went forward. Like I kind of will take one and then I'll see if it, you know, so tell yeah. me that connection with, with Royce. So I think it was right. It was the beginning of the, um, my journey. I was just doing interviews mostly at this point, And I hadn't even hit the, the meat of the interviews, like talking to people doing research yet. It was mostly scientists, friends and psychics. And then I was listening to one of my, one of the podcasts I have on rotation and they interviewed him about his book, scripting the life you want. And he talked about, it's about manifestation, but he was talking about bridging science and spirituality. And he was talking about how his book has a lot of neuroscience in it and talks about uh, the neuroscience of manifesting, um, which we don't call it that in neuroscience, but I'm super familiar with that of, you know, fine tuning your filters to help achieve your goals. Um, So everything he said and talked about, um, I was already like, oh yes. I'm like, oh, this is so great. Like to hear someone, um, be familiar with the science and talk about manifesting your goals in this way. But the use of the two words, science and spirituality together, for some reason, just, I caught my attention, maybe just because of where I was in the journey. And so I looked him up and saw he was doing um, this online workshop. This was right in the beginning of COVID. And so I signed up for it because literally so bored, nothing to do. Okay. <laughs> this was like April, 2020. Um, and well, plus I thought it would be great. I was like loving his, I ordered his book. I loved it. And so I joined, um, it was a three-part workshop the, and I joined the first one and the whole time he kept talking about neuroscience. So when we got off and before the second one, I thought, you know, I just feel disingenuous. I feel like I should tell him I'm a neuroscientist and just tell him I'm in the class because it just felt weird not to, for some reason, it was a small class. It was like 20 to 30 people. And so, um, yeah, so I, em- I just emailed him and said, you know, I, I got your book. I'm in your class, just FYI, blah, blah, blah. Um, and he wrote back immediately and And at first it was funny because the first maybe like two, three emails were very like formal, casual, whatever. And then there was just like a, oh, the second, but then we had the second class and then it was like, it was just the two of us in the class. We had a total like connecting moment where we were like old best friends that had been reunited and it was like, no one else was there. And we just hit it off. And, um, and then he emailed me immediately after and was like, Oh my God, I feel like I've known you forever. Like, um, I know we said we would set up a call in a few weeks, but let's just talk this week, (laughs) you know? And so we did. And then, yeah, we just, we've been friends who cannot have short phone calls (laughs) ever, (laughs) (laughs) ever since then. And it's been very, um, magical. And he's, I mean, he's brought a lot to, you know, helped me. He's brought a lot of knowledge that I don't have, uh, about the spiritual world. So, um, you know, he's been an amazing friend to have. Yeah. The part that was neat was when you said to, in the book was when he said to you, I'm like, I'm excited to get to know you better or reconnect. And you wouldn't have understood when he said that if you weren't the science mind of Mona wouldn't have got that. Yeah. Yeah. He said something like, again, like he was referring to 
our souls, like right. being old friends from previous lives. And yeah, I was like, oh, my old self wouldn't have even, I maybe wouldn't have even registered it, or I would have thought it was a mistake, or I definitely just wouldn't have understood what he was saying. But when I read it, I was like, oh my God, I know what he means. And, and I felt that way with him. It felt that way. Very like, yeah, it feels like we're, you know, old friends, like I've known, like I've known him forever. So it's like, we're just reconnecting. Right. And yeah. So it was very interesting. Um, it was, and it was nice to have that experience. I think so soon after reading all of that, those like, cause in a lot of the past life regression literature talks about that. Like, um, the people you meet in your life that you just click with immediately, which by the way, is one of the reasons I was interested in neuroscience when I was young. Cause I, what I was interested in, why some people get along so well and why some people don't and and how when you enter certain groups, the dynamics change or you change based on the group you're entering. Right. So I've always been interested in those things. And so it was a really interesting moment for me um, to have, as I've been reading this new literature about souls and, and whatnot, um, and then to have this experience uh, where we just meet the stranger, I don't even know, on Zoom, much, much less. Right. Was, COVID and we have this immediate instant connection. Yeah, so it was, it was like another validation almost. Yeah. I felt that way, way with him too. And I think when I saw your name and I, it was like, when I say, I don't question things when I, I know that he loves you. Like I always <laughs> know, like when I have that connection, I almost had, I don't, I mean, I, I wanted to say, Oh, I just feel so good about this. Like I, it wasn't even like, Oh, Royce, do you mind? Or can you connect me? It wasn't even like that. I yeah. that didn't even enter my mind. It was like, Oh, I'm going to connect with her. We're, we're part of the same soul family. Like, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I just, it was just natural and I, I love looking at life in that way. And tell me, so you were on this journey, you're doing your interviews with the psychics and the sci you know, like you're really diving deep and trying to figure out like, and is this where I'm going? Do I like, think of what you have a PhD and like, you know, like you went to school, USC, like you really were serious about that's not, that's the cool thing that I love. That is so fascinating to me about you is you're so far in that, but you to even have that, what that woke up moment, that pivotal moment, like when your mom did that, or when that happened and saying, wow, there is truth to this. There mm -hmm. is something because yeah. you're, you're so I mean, into this near, I'm like, you're really deep. <laughs> yeah. You're way um, beyond me. Like you're so smug, like, whoa. So yeah. here we you. go well, into this, into this little tiptoe. Are you tiptoeing? Do you feel like, or are you really, uh, I'm going to go all in and see what happens. At first, at first it was tiptoeing. Um, and then I think with the interviews, it was like a little bit more and a little bit more. Um, and then I think when I hit the people who do this kind of research or have seen things that they shared with me, um, and then I started to look at consciousness as the underlying thing, um, that's really when things started to, that's when I would say my worldview started to flip. And I think that before, before that point, before, um, because I think before that it's, it's a little bit like, how do I fit this into my materialist worldview? Um, there may for psychic phenomena, which is, it could be true, um, that there's some sort of physical signal that we can't measure yet. Um, or for spirits, there's some other explanation or whatever, like you can still try to fit it in your old worldview, but then there comes a point when you've read so much, or you finally read a different proposed worldview or, you know, something like, well, what if matter isn't the foundational principle of the universe, what a consciousness is, um, you know, then all these unexplained phenomena can be explained. You know, when you start reading things like that, then I started, which at first was, it, it sounds easy, but it was not easy for me mentally because <laughs> <it>, I <laughs> built a whole identity and ego and life around being a very serious and smart scientist. <laughs> yes, so it was, you are. yeah, well, yeah. And I felt like, um, I was betraying that or like, right. My, I wasn't going to be that anymore. And, and like you said, at the beginning, when I say old me would have hated new me, I meant it. <laughs> like I, I was, you know, looked down on people who didn't, um, basically believe in what I believed in, but to be fair to old me, <laughs> that kind of is the Western worldview is that you either adopt and 
and idolize scientific materialism. And if you don't, then you are simple, simple minded, primitive, delusional. You subscribe to magical thinking. Um, and that's the way our culture deals with it. And um, it takes a lot of self reflection and a lot of alternative worldviews and alternative evidence to flip that. And that's what would happen for me, but it took a long time and uh, a great effort. <laughs> When you look at the, your mom's, uh, part in your journey and how she, I know, I mean, you were atheist, you didn't have any belief you, agnostic when you really realize, like, I'm just not going to say anything. Like you're just neutral. Yes. I was, I was agnostic. Agnostic. Okay. Mm-hmm. So here we are agnostic. We have our mother. I, so I'm looking at it from a soul's perspective. You know, we choose our mothers, we choose our family, we choose our parents. We, that's in my belief. So when I'm reading your book and I'm listening and I'm thinking, okay, her soul is very, you know, science-based her mom and her grandmother have this, uh, spiritual in a way could, but still not, you're not going to church and anything like that. You're not raised at all with any no, kind no. of spiritual. We didn't, we weren't raised with any, um, I mean, my parents have their, my mom is spiritual, but she doesn't, she never forced us to be spiritual. So yeah, no, no religion, no organized religion really. Yeah. But you know, then I think, okay, you chose her to open this whole new, like to be in this body at this time on this planet to explore and expand your mind. Like she's part of that, you know, that catapults to you into this new expansion. Cause I like the only reason why we chose to come here is to expand. Right. And so she took you to this pivot in your life to show you like, there's so much more Mona and you came and you, and she did that for you. Like what a gift. Yeah. 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 And it was, it opened a new level to our relationship too because yeah my mom was always in the background of our you know child talking about her dreams and she had a dream and it means this and that and my brother and I would be rolling her eyes like oh my god oh my god dreams that's my house with my <laughs> girls they're rolling their eyes oh mom had another dream yeah <laughs> they roll so, their eyes <laughs> yeah and my mom had like a, a dream journal and we'd be like oh my god you know um and oh, so funny. Yeah. And so it's funny, you know, it's funny looking back on that now, but now it's like, now if I have a dream, I call my mom, <laughs> like, yeah, right. The dream I had and she'll just, you know, and she'll be like, write it down and, you know, observe what happens and find the symbols and whatever. And now I listen eagerly <laughs> to see, cause yeah, it's like, um, knowledge it's wisdom really from her, her mom and her, um, our, our whole lineage really, um, that's passed down that, yes, there's a lot of books and stuff available now, but, you know, obviously turning, if you have gifts and you have other people in your family who have gifts, it makes sense to talk to them and connect with them over it because they're the closest to you. Right. Um, Right. Genetically, spiritually, whatever. Right. You know, when, in science, when you talk with time, it's all linear, right? How do you go from where, where do you start in your life? seeing time differently do you start seeing like oh you do these past lives you start seeing time as tell me that because i'm so fascinated by time and how people they're um what they how they describe it yeah time is a mystery to me um it's one of the i think hardest things for me and other materialists or well i'm not a materialist anymore but (laughs) people who are materialists um because it's something that we seem to perceive as going forward. And so it's like, you have to overcome your perception. Um, It's the same with um, seeing things that other people cannot see or perceiving things other people cannot perceive. Um, It's real for you, but for somebody who cannot perceive it um, to convince them otherwise, it's hard, right? Because people right. basically, you know, you know what your experiences are and those are the things that resonate the best with you. And so time is a hard one to get, like my, to wrap my mind around. I leave it to the physicist to figure it out. Um, I have no idea. <laughs> so I, I don't really have a good answer. I, I just, I believe that it's 
Um, well, actually, I did read some, I don't, I can't cite the physicists, but I remember first reading that from the spiritual literature, or like the intuitive saying, they would, they would say this, even when I just went for readings and I didn't read anything, they'd always say, well, there's no time on the other side. So, and I'd be like, what the hell does that mean? There's no time on the other <laughs> side. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? We're all in one universe. But then I think when I started digging into the more, um, cause there's a lot of scientists who have tried to, and art physicists are trying to model this, model out what does the universe made of consciousness look like? What is, you know, they're trying to do the math behind it. So once I hit that literature, I was like, oh, okay, well, I don't understand it. But as long as I know that other people, um, physicists are like that the door is open to those kinds of models, then cool, you know, and even if it's not, you know, I don't, I don't think that we have to have um, everything figured out anymore, that anything's possible, but it's definitely nice to think, okay, well, this thing you have, um, you're hearing from phenomenologically from these intuitives, you can all, you know, you also have exploration of that through actual uh, like theories and math from physicists. So yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't know. It's a hard one. It's a hard one, I think, for our it human is. brains. I'm getting, uh, it's, I've always usually asked that question because it's just so, I've really, um, at the beginning, you know, like a year ago, I was really trying to wrap my head around it. It's like, it, there's, you know, it's all happening at once. Okay. We're all one. Yep. I know that, we, you know, we're all, you know, can we, how can we change the future? You know, there is no future. It's happening right now. You know, like there's so right. many. Yes. Um, I have started thinking of it in that way. And I would say before, I don't think that, I think that's newer for me. So I think in the beginning, I was very much like, oh, okay, past lives and what's my current karma. Or I was very, that was like my limited, um, cause I, that was the literature I read first. So that was my limited understanding. And mostly it was in the context of, okay, if I get this intuitive reading and they tell me an outcome, um, what is the lesson I have to learn from it? And then right. over time, yeah, I started reading um, this, this other literature and I thought, oh, okay, um, actually, yeah, it's all happening at once. Like um, if it's, if there's no, if it's all one, then in my head, it wasn't lin linear either. And it was like, oh, every moment is a new moment. And um, so, and it, but it's still hard because our brains work in time, <laughs> right. but I, but yeah, it's, it's, it's more um, exciting because there's this creative potential, I think. And, right. and that's, that's nice. That's a nice yes, thing. I love, yes, I do. I it's, I'm in that, but I think of you, like you talk about the books you read, you cite the people that you've that have been, you've studied that. What, how long do you, do you spend all day long doing that? Is that your like passion? Oh I, yeah. I read a lot. <laughs> I, yeah. a lot. I have a lot of books. Um, and I read them. I read a couple at once and I have, um, them spread out. <laughs> so if I go to a different locations, my place, um, like on the coffee table, I sit down for a few minutes, there'll be a book there, one on the dining table, one in my bedroom, so that wherever I am, I can just pick it up and read. What's, a, what's right now are you reading? What books do you? Um, I'm reading the psychic, the, the dining table one is the um, Psychedelic Explorer's Guide by Jim Fadiman. And I just finished Bernard Beitman's, um Meaningful Coincidences. He's a psychiatrist who writes about synchronicities and coincidences. That was an excellent oh, cool. book. Oh, yeah. That sounds amazing. My book is here, but yes. <laughs> I don't have to read oh, that one again. I love that it's right there. Um, so before I go, I want to go into your book and where that came from. But when you you have a newsletter that talks about psychedelics, like you're interested in that. I was listening to, I was reading that newsletter and then I was listening to a podcast that you were on talking about what you really studied that. Cause I've had a lot of guests that have done the ayahuasca, the mm -hmm. um, psilocybin, all that, and explaining their, you, you were talking about to one person that, you know, the, the, after three sessions of long, the mushroom um, therapy or medicine mm -hmm. or whatever um, is they've they've been cured of depression or, you know, they don't have to take that medicine forever, but why, why is that psychedelics so interesting to you? Yeah. Um, so my book talks, so, uh, cause it's part of the, um, story and this is how I've only recently come to finally find a way to hopefully succinctly describe it. But, you know, in the book, I talk about past life regressions. Um, so it's like, I'm, I'm going through opening the process of opening my mind to spiritual phenomena and 
psychic phenomena in the book. But along the way, I'm having an identity crisis and trying to heal myself from all the <laughs> all the reasons that I ended up in this crisis in, in the first place that contributed to it. Um, and so along the way, like I try past life regression, I try psychedelics because um, I hit, I'll, I'll explain in a minute. Um, and then, you know, I, I didn't write all of this in the book, but I tried a lot of other modalities like breath work and emotional freedom tapping and just explored a lot of different ways. And the reason I even got into those is because a lot of these, these literatures intersect with each other. And these, because when you read about the psychic phenomena, they'll say the people who get the best results are people who kind of go into like a meditative, like relaxed state. They like become one with the thing they're trying to um, connect with. If you, um, even for intuitive readings, you know, they usually say that they're like, oh, I'm going into my, whatever they'll say, theta state or <laughs> whatever. Right. Um, and so when I went to the, when I was speaking to some of the people I was speaking to the higher level people, they're the ones who said, have you looked at psychedelics? I don't know if you know this, but a lot of paranormal things can happen on psychedelics. And so I went to look, read, read about it. Cause I've never, I had never even thought about psychedelics. I didn't care about them at all. Um, and that's when I was like, oh my God, it became like Alice in Wonderland. I was just so focused on psychedelics for a, for a good <laughs> few weeks. I got every paper, every book I could. Um, so and it was true. He was right. And people, there's this long um, history, especially from the 50s, 60s, and 70s before they were banned of um, lots of reports of people have telepathy or like when you're in a session with people feeling like you not even feel like knowing what the other person is thinking, knowing, feeling each other's emotions, but also getting vision, precognitive visions that are true. Um, a lot of people who do ayahuasca often report, you know, they'll see a family member uh, and then they find out later that that family member died and they had no reason to think that that person was was going to die. So like people who would spontaneously die, a uh, family member, they their family member would be the middle of the jungle doing ayahuasca totally unaware and then they would have a vision while doing the trip and so I've came to realize that these altered states of consciousness whether it's psychedelics or breath work or meditation or whatever they allow they're actually where personal healing intersects with the spiritual and with the quote unquote paranormal or the transpersonal. So they're actually where all those things come together. Um, and I think psychedelics, I just um, think it's interesting because it's like going through a renaissance now and being um, re-energized in Western culture. And what I think it's interesting and predictable is that they're trying to strip away, like they're trying to find, see, can we can we get a chemical um, substitute so it's to a psychedelic where you can get the healing effect without the trip? you know, or can we do it outside of the context of um, traditional rituals? But, you know, we unclear, you know, hopefully people will do studies to examine that, but it's such a Western way. I just think it's like an interesting case study on how the West would like to just <laughs> force everything into its own um, box and framework. Um, but I think that since psychedelics have a kind of a foot in the door because they've actually been fast-tracked by the FDA for depression and PTSD, um, that not only are they a foot in the door for mental health, but it's a foot in the door for spirituality and right. for the transpersonal because everyone who does these things will come out transformed and they will have, not everyone, but most, you know, a lot of people do come out having touched that side of reality and they're changed forever. So mm -hmm. that's why I think it's really an interesting time and an interesting topic. And you have done them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what kind? Um, I have psilocybin, LSD, uh, and I did um, five MEO DMT. And I think that's it. Yeah. So what, tell me what your experience, because you know what, it called me like two years ago, maybe three years ago, I forget. I was listening to something and I remember Rhythmia. Have you heard of Rhythmia in Costa Rica? Uh, is it a retreat? Yeah. Yeah. They, so. they do ayahuasca there. And I was yeah. like, Oh, I come, I'm listening to this podcast and I'm like, Richard, I'm going to go to Costa Rica. And he's like, what? <laughs> and I'm like, Oh my, I was so, it, it ca was calling me, you know, they always say mm -hmm. like, if it's calling yeah. you, you yes. know, and then I started hearing the you know, throwing up and people in there. And like, I just, it just all scared me. And I'm not, I've never done drugs. Mm -hmm. You know, I've not, I don't, it's like a feeling of, I don't know if I want to get that feeling. And then I've interviewed people that 
um, you know, have done the cactus. I forget Stephen Shaw oh, was on mm-hmm. my, what mescaline. is that called? Mescaline. And he was saying that doesn't make you have those effects. And it, it cured him of PTSD. Mm-hmm. When he said that, I was like, oh, he just had this terrible, um, reoccurring PTSD. And he, yeah. that was his answer, but yeah. tell me what your experience. Cause I'd love to. Hear yeah. That. Um, there's a lot to say, but it's basically the psychedelics. So just the, from the therapeutic standpoint, all they do, do is allow you to access things that normally your conscious mind suppresses your conscious mind, like doesn't want you to feel pain or be sad. So it tries to keep all those, you know, it, it actually, um, directs your behavior to avoid pain, right? That's why we have all these weird behaviors that we do, um, that we acquire over our lifetimes. And really what the psychedelics do is help get that out of the way. So you can get to more easily the unconscious things that are, that need to be healed, that are traumas that have been suppressed for a long time. Um, that's why it's important though, to do it usually in a con either a ceremonial or a therapeutic right. context, because if those things come up and you're not in a situ and you're not in a good situ- set and setting, you're not with someone who can support you. Suddenly your traumas are right there and you're not going to be supported. So it's super important to have an experienced guide with you. Um, but that's from the therapeutic aspect. And that's usually why, why people do it. So it's great in that way. It just facilitates that. So as long as you have a guide who can help you through that, um, then you're good to go. I haven't done ayahuasca. I, I had similar concerns. It does not (laughs) sound pleasant, but it also from the things I've read, it does seem to be the most healing. Um, but they're all very, they're all very good. And it just depends on dose and what you're looking for. But so for LSD, um, LSD was really well studied in the the fifties to the seventies by psychiatrists. And they actually wrote this LSD handbook that I read before I did it. And um, it's for therapists. And so it walks them through the entire experience for them and for the patient. And they tell them you, you can have your patient write a list of questions beforehand, um, self-reflection questions. And then, you know, a couple hours into the trip when they're not so, um, high, um, you can have them look at the questions and there's, you know, conscious mind is out of the way and they'll, they'll get answers from themselves immediately. And that's what I did. So I wrote questions. I took out LSD. And then a few hours later, um, I looked at my questions and I got like immediate answers. And the interesting thing about psychedelics is not that it's a thought, it's like an understanding. It's like you, you understand completely with your whole being what the issue is or has been for you. So, um, yeah, so they're very, very healing. Um, but they definitely should be, (laughs) they call it a container. There has to be a safe, a safe container and a good guide. Um, but yeah, it just, I mean, I think they're great. Yeah. So it's something that you would use as a practice, like you would continually do that to keep opening and um, yeah, like, I mean, I think over, over a lifetime, the thing with them is that they last for, for a long time, right? They're like, like LSD lasts for 12 hours, psilocybin lasts for six to eight hours. So you have to have like a whole a full day and the, the day after sometimes to recover. So it's a little bit, t- you know, a time constraint, but yeah, I mean, I, I think of them as tools in my toolbox forever right. to, yeah, to come back to time. And again, for sure, there are of course dangers they're of course not appropriate for everyone who, you know, if you have a serious medical or heart condition, you know, you have to make sure you, if you're going to choose a retreat right. or something, make sure they screen for all of that. Cause you don't, but they're not addictive. Um, I think if there's been any reports, there's very few reports of anyone passing away from, or having very adverse effects, but there's always a risk, right. With everything. So, right. With the old you, Mona, look at the new you doing that. Like she's crazy. Um, yeah, I used, I mean, I have, um, friends in graduate school who would do shrooms. They would go to the desert and do shrooms. And I remember, yeah, they would invite me and I was like, no, why would I do that? That's insane. (laughs) Like, I don't want to, but the funny thing is I say, I don't want to hallucinate, but, um, but you don't even necessarily hallucinate. I mean, it's just, it's, again, it's all about dose. (laughs) Dose right. set and setting. So doing it right in the setting. Yeah. So as we end our beautiful hour that I love to c- continue what, um, so you wrote your book, let's kind of go there and, and talk about where we can find you, your website, um, what yes. you're doing now, what, 
you know, where are we at in this journey? Yes, my, um, my newsletter and my links to my book and all that are on my website, which is monasobaniphd.com. Um, I do a lot of various things, consulting, I write the newsletter. Um, I've been helping um, the Institute of Noetic Sciences. I write one of their blogs once a month and I have a, a company with two friends. So <laughs> I'm doing a lot do? of different things. Yeah, I, it's a te- it's technology though. It's nothing related to this. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. Um, and I'm, yeah, I mean, I started writing a second book and I'm thinking of uh, of some other things, but it's all kind of jumbled in my head at the moment, but I'm thinking ahead of what to do next. And I, one thing I am thinking of doing is and I'm in the process of starting it with, a, with one of my, actually, I've had neuroscientists reach out to me um, who are excited to you know talk about their experiences with someone finally. Um, and with one of these people, we're thinking about putting together a retreat where not like a long retreat, just like a day or something um, where we could invite scientists to come. And in the book, I, I, you know, ask that I invite them to engage the mystical or spiritual in whatever way they want. But we were thinking, what if we could organize a one day retreat where we help them do that? <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Cool. yeah, so we were trying to put that together. Oh, I love it. Oh, I love your story. You're amazing. Thank you I so love much for having you. me. It was so oh. nice meeting you. It was so Family. nice to meet you. And I'm just in San Diego, so oh, we're not that far away. Yeah, maybe I'll get, to, still in LA. I'll get to meet you in person one day. Yes, I'm still in LA. Yeah, fun. Anyway, everyone go find Mona. All the links are will be in the show notes to um, connect with her. And where do you see yourself in five years? I don't even, like, what, what do you see? Like, where's Mona? You know, I don't do that anymore. (laughs) (laughs) So I've done that my whole life. And oh, cool. I'm glad I asked you. I know I'm taking a break from that, but hopefully I'm doing something that I love and I feel fulfilled doing it. (laughs) Yes. And you know what? It's living in the moment. You know, we, there's no better way to live than looking you know, and we have these like vision boards, you know, I, we do that, but you know, it's like living in the moment, having an awareness Mm -hmm. of your, you know, the oneness of who you are and your vibration and living in that place and seeing the magic every day and being in nature and looking at the trees or the butterflies, that's life. That's love and being that love for, um, for life, for being in this body. Yeah. So I'm trying to embody that and be, (laughs) just in the present. Yeah. Good. I love that answer on that note. I will hopefully meet you again one day. I know we know each other. Thank you.